Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining. So um, today's panel um, is about um, highlighting inaccessible MENA materials during a pandemic. Um, today we have four participants, um, but the presentation of um, some participants was actually written by a fifth person. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, everyone in order of, um, uh, in the order that they will speak. Uh, and what I propose is that um, all of the presentations um, are made at 20 minutes each, and then we keep the question period um, for the end. So the first presentation will be given uh, by um, Dr. Mariam uh, Aborez, who's a translation support officer at the British Library. Qatar Foundation Partnership Program, and also a lecturer in translation at University College of London. She holds a PhD in linguistics and an MA in language studies, and is also a chartered linguist with a diploma in translation. Her research mainly relates to uh, language politics and language ideologies in the Arab world. Her co-presenter, Kirsteith Reed, uh, Reed Kirsted, uh, is a Gulf history cataloger uh, at the British Library Qatar Foundation Partnership Program, uh, and she produces bibliographic descriptions of India office records materials for the Qatar Digital Library. Her interests include international bilingual archives, community-based archives, and conscientious description. Uh, the presentation was initially proposed, uh, and I believe uh, written, but correct me if I'm wrong, by Dr. David Woodbridge, who is uh, also a Gulf history cataloger at the British Library Qatar Foundation Partnership Program. Um, Dr. Woodbridge holds a PhD in history, and his, his research focuses on the history of British imperialism in India. Uh, Mariam? And proceed, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Anais. Thank you very much. Um, and yes, our uh, presentation was partially written by David Woodbridge, so we've kept his name on our presentation. So we'll just wait for the slides to load up. If you bear with us two seconds while we switch over. Um, to displaying uh, the slides. Yeah, I'm just um, going to try and swap screens. We tried technological magic, but uh, yes, um, um, had to do it the manual way, I'm afraid. Uh, oh, it's not letting me swap, um, swap screens this time. <laughs> had the option. Oh. <laughs> Please give me a second. I'm just going to try and figure this out. But if you unshare and reshare, um, I uh, okay. I'll try doing that. Stop sharing and let's share again. Um, Okay. I'm guessing you can still see the same screen. Yeah. It was under display settings last time, but is it not letting you? Yes, I'm trying to Ooh, stop sharing the close. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Despite all Problem. the testing. <laughs> if it's easier, I can actually share the slides for you. Um, I think let me just try to do it one more time, just because I know when we need to kind of flip over to the like next lights. So I'm just going to give it one more try. Okay, um, let's see if this works. Can you still see the slide? Yeah, Google? still the notes. Okay, right. So, um, sorry. I'm going to do this. I'm going to try and um, interesting. There was an option to swap screens before, but um, it doesn't show anymore. 
Um, I also have mine ready to go, so. Okay. Um, oh, this is annoying. Okay. I'm just going to try one more time to share and reshare. I'm not sure that's going to change anything, but um, let me see if I change this. Can you see anything at all now? Uh, we can see the PowerPoint um, opened uh, as a fewer um, okay. editing. Um, if I do this, can you still see the notes? We can just see the notes again, yeah. Okay, I'm going to try one final thing. I'm sorry, just bear with me. And I'll stop share. And I'll share again. Um, Can you see it now, or is it the small view? It's the small view again. Um, I don't know if everyone can read that. Um, oh. Ah, right. Oh, yes, I can see the swap presenter. All right, I can see it now. I think I know what I need to do, so I'm just going to stop sharing one more time. Sorry, bear with me. <laughs> and there we are. Okay. And I'll just move it here. Open that. Share screen. Fingers crossed. And share that. And then now what I need to do is, so the option came up now. I think what's happening is that um, my screen is blocking some of the options just because the controls are at the top. I just need to move them. I can find the same controls again. Ugh. They showed up on the other screen, but um, they've disappeared now. It's just genuinely annoying. <sighs> Sorry. Deep breath. Promise we'll get there. Yeah, we, we still see the presentation um, open, not the slideshow. Okay, well, I'm going to yeah. try and open the slideshow now. And then I think what I need to do is just try to move this problem as, yeah, aha, uh -huh. I think I can. Can you see the slideshow now? Yes, yes okay. we can, excellent. Okay, ready well, to go. Finally, okay. okay. Right. Thank you very much, everyone, and sincere apologies for the delay, um, but I think we're still going to manage to go on time. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kirsty Reid, and I'm a cataloger on the British Library Qatar Foundation Partnership Programme, as you've probably already heard. Uh, today, uh, myself and my translation colleague, uh, Mariam Abeles, are going to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing over the last 18 months or so to help open up some of the material that we work with on the Qatar Digital Library. Before we begin, we wish to warn you that this presentation contains some outdated and offensive language. So as we have a lot of ground to cover um, in the next uh, few minutes, I'll just start with giving you the headlines of what you need to know. So firstly, the programme that Mariam and I work on is a partnership between the British Library and the Qatar National Library, which comes under the umbrella of the Qatar Foundation. It's based around a large scale digitisation project of material from the British Library and other institutions that relates to the Persian Gulf region, with most material coming from the India office records. The digitised material is hosted on the Qatar Digital Library or the QDL, an open access website which is totally bilingual and run by the Qatar National Library. We have our own in-house translation team and everything that we write for the QDL is available in both English and Arabic. So the bilingual nature of the QDL is reflected in our user stats. The QDL has a high volume of traffic and the top countries accessing the site equally represent the English and Arabic speaking worlds. 
Internal stats also show us that there is an equal divide between the most viewed pages of the site, with half being accessed in English and half being accessed in Arabic. So that's who we are and what we do in a nutshell. And the projects we're going to talk to you about today were born out of the significant shifts that form the basis of this conference themes, namely the COVID-19 pandemic and the global Black Lives Matter protest that took place last year. The first project to talk about is our review of the QDL glossary, which was identified early on in the first lockdown as a suitable project to work on in view of our normal tasks. The second project that we started last year was our Conscientious Bilingual Description Project. And the seed for this project was planted in November 2019 by Dr. Melissa Bennett, who gave us a talk on her experiences reviewing offensive language used in legacy descriptions at the Museum of London. And both the pandemic and heightened focus on anti-racism provided the impetus to begin serious work in this area for us. Both projects are closely linked and involved many of the same people from the translation and cataloging teams. Hopefully we'll also have a minute to mention some recent work the translation team have been doing to streamline our transliteration process. So inspired by the work of others, such as the Words Matter glossary produced by the National Museum of World Cultures in the Netherlands and enabled by lockdown to spend time on the issue, a project team of catalogers and translators began investigating the presence of potentially problematic terms in our project. Our main motivations were to ensure that users would not encounter harmful, offensive language without warning or without anything within the description to indicate that the language used was now unacceptable. We also recognise the danger in there not being sufficient distance between the language of the original archival record and the description of the modern record processor, not only in terms of causing harm, but also in terms of problematic language masking the bias of the record creator or subconsciously adopting their perspective. After some research into existing work being done, we began our own investigations. We used the Words Matter glossary as a starter list and then added terms based on our own experience and knowledge of the records. To search these terms, we used a combination of existing tools, such as the QDL search function and the search tool within MemoQ, which is the translation management software used by translating. We also used a Python script called the Catalogers Friend, which was developed for us by Satirius Alpanis, our former head of digital operations. And this allowed us to zone in on the use of terms within scope and content fields. With regards to how to treat these terms, we used a combination of existing recommendations from other studies and our own additional layers of treatment. So as we began investigating these terms, it soon became clear to us that it was rarely the case that a term could be easily identified as problematic or not problematic. Rather, it often depended on the context in which a term was being used. So we came up with four categories to help us to work out what treatment was required. And it also became apparent that different types and levels of treatment were needed. In some cases, minimal action was required, but in other cases, a greater variety of approaches were needed. So we're just going to go through an example for each category to give you an idea of the breadth of terms and the forms of treatment applied. So first, there are terms that we've judged to be not problematic, such as tribe. This term has been flagged in other studies as problematic because of how it can imply that a society is primitive or pre-modern. But from our research, we could see that this was not the case in a Middle East context because tribe is generally, generally used as the equivalent of the Arabic term Kabila. So there was no need for catalogers to treat this term any differently. But we did advise catalogers not to overgeneralize and to use the specific name of the tribe concerned where possible. The second category is terms that are only sometimes problematic, such as native. This term is unproblematic if it's being used to describe a relationship between a person and the place they are from, for example, a native of Bahrain. However, we noticed that often in the records, the name native was being applied to groups of people from a variety of places. For example, in phrases such as native ships or native rulers, further research showed that the ships and rulers in question actually came from very different geographical areas. So native was essentially being used here as a catch-all phrase for non-British or non-European. And the use of the word like this resulted in many distinct groups being lumped together in an indiscriminate and demeaning way, which in turn could serve to reinforce the idea of a colonial hierarchy. 
So for instances like this, we've recommended that the term is placed in single quotation marks in catalogue descriptions to show that this is the language being used in the records. And it's also suggested that the cataloger provide further information in square brackets, providing the names of individuals and specific places if known, or at least with as precise as possible description of the geographic areas they came from. The third category is for those terms which, as far as we could tell, are always problematic when they appear in the records. An example of this are the terms pirate and piracy, which appear frequently in records relating to the Gulf, particularly during the 19th century, when Britain sent several military, military expeditions to the Gulf with the express aim of eradicating piracy. So the labeling of certain Arab tribes as pirates therefore represents a British point of view. And so we've recommended that catalogers don't use it in their catalog descriptions unless they're quoting from the archival records themselves, in which case it should be placed in single quotation marks. But as we investigated this term more, we decided it needed further explanation for our users because it was apparent that what was understood by piracy differed among different people and has changed over time. For example, to translate the English term piracy, the translation team use a modern Arabic term. But this term is not the same as that used in the primary Arabic sources, which suggests that an equivalent concept didn't exist among the Arab inhabitants of the Gulf. So while the modern Arabic term accurately renders the meaning of the English term piracy, by translating it this way, we are effectively imposing a British historical perspective on the records. To address all of this requires other forms of treatment. So we'll be adding piracy to the QDL's glossary. And we've also written an article which will be published on the QDL and which will explain the history of the term and its use in the records from both an English and Arabic language perspective. The final category is for the terms of treatment, the, the group of terms that we consider to be both problematic and offensive, and therefore needing urgent treatment. An example of this is Mohammedan, which is used in the records by British officials to refer to Muslims or anything related to Islam. And it's considered offensive because it implies that Muslims worship the Prophet Muhammad and not God. So we recommended that catalogers always place this term within single quotation marks and follow it with Muslim or Islamic in square brackets as appropriate. We also decided to add the term to the QDL's glossary in order to provide further context and explanation for users. So as you can see from these examples, terms have unpredictable complexities and it has required thorough research and careful reflection in order to come up with suitable recommendations for dealing with these terms. Mariam is now going to talk you through some of the considerations from the translation team's point of view. You're on mute, Mariam. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, since we're operating within a bilingual project, our treatment of potentially problematic terms includes additional considerations related to translation. The text that an Arabic reader typically encounters on the QDL is a layered text. The translated Arabic text is based on the English catalog description, which in turn is based on the primary source. It's worth mentioning that while we tend to think of translation as something that only takes place after the catalog description is produced, there is actually a great deal of translation that takes place at the catalog cataloging stage. Even when all of the content is in English, the act of interpreting information from a different historical era and packing it into a catalog description for modern readers is itself a form of translation. We have overlapping responsibilities towards these three layers. In the first layer, our responsibility towards the primary sources shared with catalogers. This is to accurately represent the content while appropriately distancing ourselves from it. But as translators, we have a particular responsibility towards the primary sources when they are in Arabic. We use modern Arabic to translate the catalog descriptions and this can sometimes create a divide between the translated description and the language of the original source. A prime example of this is the term piracy and its modern Arabic equivalent, Karsana, as Kirsty has highlighted. In the next layer, we have a responsibility to produce a translation that is closely aligned with the English catalog description. But some terms, even if they are not immediately problematic in English, can have problematic connotations if they are translated as is. An example of this is the word possessions, a technical colonial term meaning territories under the rule of. The direct Arabic translation Mumtalaket invokes connotations of entitlement that can be insensitive to the Arabic reader. So we agreed to avoid using possessions where possible and spell out its meaning to ensure that there are no gaps between the English and Arabic descriptions. Finally, we have a responsibility towards the Arabic reader. 
One aspect of this is exercise and care when transliterating and back translating names of people and places that they are so that they are meaningful to the Arabic reader. Another aspect is flagging terms that may be offensive to the, to the Arabic reader, such as Muhammadan, which Kirsty has also covered. All of this, of course, is situated within a wider ethical responsibility towards decolonization. And here we mean the cultural movement. It is a responsibility that we have as employees in the cultural and heritage sectors, but especially as employees in a partnership between the national libraries of a former colonizer and its former protectorate. The outcome of this project so far are two new sets of guidelines, one for catalogers and one for translators. We have identified 40 terms, each term provided with a note explaining its background and using the records, and then a set of recommendations for how to treat this term. We intend for these to be living guidelines that can be edited and added to as we become conscious of new terms. These are still at draft stage, so we consult as we consult with relevant teams across the British Library and the Qatar National Library and gather val valuable feedback, especially from the India Office Records team. Ideally, our next steps would be to draft a content warning and to convert our guidelines into a public guide slash glossary, similar to the Words Matter Guide. Discussions about this are still ongoing. The second project we engaged in in, in, in an effort to open up our collections over the past year is reviewing the QDL glossary. The QDL benefits from a dedicated glossary page on the website, which is laid out like a traditional glossary with terms arranged alphabetically. There is also a hyperlink function. When a glossary term comes up in a catalog description or an article, it will be in purple. Users can hover over the term to see a short definition, or they can click on the term, which will take them to the longer definition in the main glossary page. The weakness of the glossary before our review was that it was essentially underdeveloped. Because, of the, because the production of descriptions and articles has always been our priority, we never had a dedicated team working on the glossary before. Terms were added and defined in a, in a piecemeal fashion, and the glossary was sparse, with less than 40 entries. It was also inconsistent. Some positions in groups and non-English terms were, were included, but others equally important to our context were not. And although the glossary terms had been translated into Arabic, that Arabic version had not been edited with Arabic language users in mind. So the list included terms which were unnecessary to explain to Arabic speakers, and at the same time was missing some terms that could be really useful to explain to an Arabic speaking audience. With normal duties becoming less urgent during the success of lockdowns, we had the opportunity to consider the glossary as a whole and to develop it with a concerted effort from catalogers and translators. And this has been a real game changer. We have been able to increase the glossary in size and scope and to improve its quality, and the Arabic glossary now overlaps but does not replicate the English glossary and includes terms which are specifically targeted to our Arabic users. We now have a list of over 130 terms on the English side and around 100 on the Arabic side. Our definitions go beyond the term's general meaning and ground them and ground that term in the context of our records, which a dictionary or a Wikipedia entry could not do. Similar to the conscientious description project, we've also identified glossary terms that would benefit from further explanation in the form of an article. Taking a bird's eye view at the glossary meant we could develop criteria for which terms would be suitable and which wouldn't work. And doing everything at the same time also meant that we could ensure a degree of consistency in the definitions provided, such as the level of detail given. We've channeled this experience into mechanisms to ensure the glossary will be regularly updated and reviewed with guidelines for suggested, su suggesting terms and an established process for writing and reviewing definitions. And as for the next steps, now there's just a small matter of implementation. The terms are currently with our partners at the Qatar National Library, and we should be able to start updating the, the QDL glossary soon. We also plan to continue adding terms to the glossary on a more regular basis. The last undertaking we will highlight today is our recent efforts to streamline our approach to transliterating terms from non-Latin script languages, particularly Arabic. Our catalogers will typically encounter these names in the records in obscure, romanized forms that make it difficult to determine what the term was in the original language. In the past, many catalogers would follow these spellings with transliteration within square brackets. But the practice was not consistent and inaccuracies were likely to slip through. Taking advantage of the language expertise in our program, we have now streamlined the process so that catalogers can use SharePoint, our project management system, to raise a ticket with translators. The ticket includes the name as it appears in the record, the language, and any helpful research notes and contextual information. The translation, which follows Library of Congress conventions, is provided by one translator and reviewed by another before the cataloger is alerted that the query is resolved. 
The name is also then added to our translation term base, and all the transliterated names remain available on SharePoint for catalogers to consult. This improved process helps us fulfill our responsibility towards our users, and it also aligns with our conscientious approach as a form of respect towards people whose names have been distorted by the record creators. So in terms of outcomes, we believe that the work we have done with these projects has many benefits, including some tangible outcomes. The key outcome is improved cataloging and translation in the form of more consistency in our practices and more distances and more distance between ourselves and the record creators. In addition, the more specific naming of individuals, groups, and locations enhances discoverability on the QDL, and the extra layers of context to the records enriches the user experience. These projects have also helped us consolidate and enhance our existing practices. We were reassured to find that most catalogers and translators were already being conscientious, and some of the existing practice that we identified fed into the new recommendations. They also gave us an opportunity to use some of our tools creatively and to expand the scope of existing resources to cater for a wide set of needs without having to invest in new software or web development. Lastly, we believe that these projects embody the British Library value of putting users at the heart of what we do, and the QDL stated purpose of providing a resource that is for everyone. By expanding the context, pro context provided through the glossary and the articles, the QDL caters to both new and experienced users. The steps we have taken to address the language in our records is a sign of respect to users, as well as to our staff. We believe the work we have done creates more bridges across the two languages of our bilingual site, with improvements that benefit users working in either language. These are some of the resources that we have found useful. Thank you very much for listening. Kirsty and I look forward to your questions and feedback. And if you're interested in news from our partnership program, do follow us on Twitter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mo, for a great presentation, and thank you for speeding it up so that we uh, we can remain on uh, on schedule. Our next presenter is Dr. Hachik Moradian, uh, who is the Armenian and Georgian Area Specialist at the African and Middle Eastern Division at the Library of Congress, uh, and he's also a lecturer at Columbia University. His research and teaching focus on uh, the Armenian genocide, late Ottoman history, imperialism, mass violence, urban space, and conflict in the Middle East. Dr. Moradian, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, so today, my, my portion, uh, my intervention is going to be focusing on uh, a collection of books close to several hundred uh, largely readily available in libraries that do carry Armenian language content around the world and also increasingly digital. And in many ways, ones that sort of uh, have gained increased uh, significance, importance for a number of reasons, not just for Armenians and those who speak the language and read the language, but also for historians, demographers of the Middle East, uh, the Ottoman Empire, and uh, broadly, those who are interested, interested in uh, genealogy uh, and, and, and culture and history. Uh, of course, added uh, to this uh, large list is, is the context, context of the pandemic. One of the things that happened uh, over the past couple of years as we uh, essentially are in the maelstrom of, of COVID-19 is uh, people uh, between lockdowns, quarantine, uh, loss of family members, going into boxes in their attic, going through papers and documents and trying to think and piece together uh, family stories, family histories and uh, connections to places oftentimes from which they're far removed in the here and now. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, the theme of displacement is going to be figuring prominently here. And I can uh, readily already think of a number of other cases and experiences that sort of inform what I'm going to be speaking about, including the Palestinian one, uh, as well as uh, the, the Jewish experience in the aftermath of World War II uh, uh, through use core books. So uh, after this vague introduction, uh, I want to say a few words about uh, the, the set of books that I'm talking about. So uh, in the aftermath of uh, the Armenian Genocide and World War I, uh, 
where uh, you have the dis destruction of the Armenian population of the Ottoman Empire, and at the same time, uh, the displacement and the survival of uh, tens of thousands of Armenians who end up in countries primarily in the Middle East, in the emerging Middle East, but also in Europe and the United States. There is this uh, severed connection between the homeland, which was part of the Ottoman Empire, the hometowns and villages to which Armenians no longer are able to return, and where many Armenians found themselves scattered around the globe, right? And in this kind of uh, uh, reality, uh, Armenians strove to keep the memory of their home times, hometowns alive uh, in the minds of uh, subsequent generations. And this essentially led to the birth and the emergence of uh, a literary form, a literary genre called uh, Hushamadiyan, memorial book or memory book, uh, which essentially uh, uh, tells the stories of these towns and locations, as well as how life was there uh, prior to World War I. So uh, we are talking about, uh, depending on how we define memorial books and a broad and narrow definition can make a huge difference here. We're talking about a few hundred uh, specialized periodicals dedicated to the Armenian populated regions of the Ottoman Empires. Same thing with books uh, as well. Uh, so between periodicals and books, we're talking about a few hundred. Uh, and, and many of these are published primarily in the Armenian diaspora uh, beginning in the 1920s. And it picks up uh, a couple of decades later. Uh, but also in Soviet Armenia. Soviet Armenia was, uh, you know, Armenia gained uh, for a brief period independence between 1918 and 1920, and then it was Sovietized. But in Soviet Armenia as well, there were some publications that fit within this category of memorial books. Uh, so uh, what I will be focusing on are the collections at the Library of Congress, uh, which are quite expansive, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have, uh, you know, there are large co collections of memorial books, uh, both in Armenian libraries around the world, as well as uh, other libraries. Uh, let me give a couple examples to illustrate the contents of these publications and, and, and the way in which they, their uh, increased, the increased interest around them can be significant. Uh, let's take the city of uh, Gaziantep, modern day Gaziantep, Aintab uh, uh, in, in the Ottoman Empire. Near, near the, the Syrian border today. Uh, this is a place that boasts half a dozen memorial books. Uh, there's a two volume, 2000 page book called the history of Arme Antab Armenians and a 320 page uh, English language version of it by the same author uh, published in 1953 and 57 respectively. There are, there are two Armenian language periodicals connected to one another. Uh, one is called Armin Aintab and the other is uh, New Aintab in the 1960s and 70s. Again, these are periodicals entirely dedicated to, uh, to the city, to the city as, uh, as it is, to the city as it is imagined after uh, being separated from it, to those who hail from that town or city and, and their culture and tradition, as well as uh, the compatriotic uh, organizations and unions that are formed across the diaspora. Uh, of people from particular cities. So Aintab Armenians had their unions around the world, including the Middle East and the United States. Uh, and the other examples that I will be giving had similar uh, unions as well. And in fact, uh, many of these memory books, memorial books were either the initiatives of uh, such unions or at least the discussions for publishing such books often emerged in the context of these, these unions uh, of Armenians from said towns scattered around the world. Uh, to, uh, uh, and uh, so one of the interesting things, and maybe Antab is a, is a good example of this, is how uh, the memory of a particular city and environment is carried uh, with the survivor generation in the 1920s and afterwards, and with their descendants. Uh, through these books and the way in which oftentimes we see a divergence of what ends up being the city of Aintab and life and reality in the city of Aintab. And of course the Aintab that many of these people remember uh, directly or 
uh, you know, through uh, their, their parents, their grandparents, and these memory books, and and and, and imagine. Uh, and I will say a little bit about then an encounter between the old and the new, uh, the the imagined today and the real uh, later on. Uh, this was a common phenomenon, and it was not typical to just major towns and cities. So there were close to two million Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, tens of thousands, several hundred thousand, in fact, will survive the genocide. And many of them are going to be from uh, very small towns and villages. But even tiny villages have often memory books, entire volumes dedicated to them. To give the, one example is, is, is the village of Ohu. This was a, a village, uh, Bulhurjuk in, in modern uh, Turkey. This was a village in the region of Palu. And it had only 25 households before the Armenian genocide, just 25 households. And there is a book, 181 page book about the village, just to give you a sense of, uh, you know, how this became an important way of preserving the homeland and a connection to the homeland. And even if there were just a few people who survived from a particular location, they made every effort to piece together the story, the narrative of life before the war. And, and connect others in this context. So in that sense, uh, memorial books offer a window into the history, demography, culture, customs, genealogy, trades, and crafts of the region they cover. You know, genealogy is a good example. You have uh, family trees, uh, genealogy wheels. Uh, you have extensive demographic information that is important, not just for uh, historians of Armenian historians, Armenian studies experts, but also for Ottoman uh, historians and uh, historians of the Middle East. Uh, they often feature dozens of photographs, maps. Uh, in one case, uh, a book on uh, Cis Kozan, a modern day Kozan, published in Beirut in 1949, features three maps and some 200 images. There's also an aspect of highlighting the continuity, right? Many of these books will have sections near the end where they highlight those who hail from those cities that are now left behind in, in, in the Republic of Turkey and, uh, and, and the children of many of those who hail from those cities, particularly those who, have a, who are accomplished in certain fields, who are better known in certain uh, you know, uh, uh, fields, uh, they will be featured. Uh, you know, and this, this is an interesting, this, this back end of many of these books is also sort of uh, demonstrating, right, the presence of the town's culture and heritage, and it and the way in which it survived, even though it is in you know scattered around the world. Its its children are scattered around the world, and the way in which essentially anyone who is successful, however that is defined, uh, across the world who hails from that town is sort of also the torchbearer of the legacy and the heritage of their ancestors who were. Uh, dispossessed and pushed out of their towns and villages. Now, uh, I will share in a uh, momentarily a few images before I conclude, but uh, I want to give also a little bit of a sense of the language in, in these works. Uh, uh, naturally, uh, compiling these volumes uh, requires years of research and outreach to uh, by, by the authors, by the editors. Uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, there's a quote here that sort of captures it uh, in an interesting way. This is by Antoine Poladian, who writes a, a memory book about Arabkir, which was published in New York in 1969. And here's what he says in the introduction. He says, sometimes I had to read an entire volume to compile a one page biography. This is about compiling biographies of people who hailed from that town. Let me say, however, that it was easier to concern oneself with the dead than the living. For example, to receive the biography of a teacher in living in Syria, I wrote three letters and received the biography only after four years. But the authors of memory books persevered despite these challenges. The, the rewards were so far, far greater from their perspective for their people. Uh, they believe that otherwise their people are condemned to forget their homeland and acculturate. Uh, Misa Keleshian, who wrote a memory, memory book on Sis, Kozan, today. Uh, his, his angst is palpable in the introduction to the book. He writes, another decade or two 
with the disappearance of the elders who remember our birthplace, narrators of its beauty would no longer have existed. And our children and grandchildren headed in a direction away of homeland and memory, left to the mercy of the wings of fortune, surrendered to the all-consuming floods of foreign shores, would have to prepare for the permanent loss of traditions. And therefore, he says, I'm quoting him again, consumed by the aim of preempting this horrible disaster, we got to work and made an effort to instill among Armenians and particularly among the people of Sis, the love of their birthplace. Now, uh, in, in many ways, uh, you know, what, what happened during the, during the pandemic is as many uh, people, particularly Armenians uh, around the world and here in the United States, were opening up these boxes, uh, there was this uh, increased interest in memorial books and, and stories and genealogy and, and the towns and villages from which they hailed. This is palpable, noticeable in, in the requests uh, we receive uh, in the uh, both of Ask a Librarian, emails and others. This is palpable also in, in the interest that we see in general online these days uh, in terms of uh, sharing uh, digital content related to memory books and others. And in many ways, uh, it seems like this is the kind of period where we are uh, trying to uh, accelerate a process that had already started of making many of these materials available online. Uh, the Library of Congress has several memorial books particularly in, uh, in manuscript form uh, that, you know, I mentioned earlier that there's a, a few hundred that have been published, but there are hundreds of others that are, uh, that are never published and are scattered in collections around the world, including the Library of Congress, which has a couple. And again, uh, there, you know, one of the initiatives we, uh, we have, have is to essentially uh, digitize uh, the, the manuscripts that we are we have in our possessions that are unpublished. Uh, so let me, uh, as I as I approach conclusion and talk about the, uh, the the current application of many memorial books, let me share first a, a few images, sort of that speak to their applicability uh, in general. So this is, uh, this is just a quick introduction to a website that is entirely dedicated to memorial books. Uh, what they do is they uh, collect and present feature uh, content on memorial books. The website is hushamadian.org. Hushamadian is the Armenian word for memorial books. And it is a, a rich resource for, uh, you know, culture, tradition, and all of the material, almost all of the material is brought together from the memorial book tradition and many of the sources that I have been talking about and, and mentioning. Now, one of the things that, uh, that really uh, we see in many of these memorial books are, uh, you know, the, these, uh, you know, photography is, is, is important. There are thousands and thousands of photographs scattered in these memorial books, and you can see their implication with the captions, with information about the families, etc. And you can see their, their significance for, for a lot of people scattered around the world. There are multiple maps, uh, often focusing on a particular location, uh, or sometimes regional maps. Uh, uh, some of these maps have uh, great significance beyond, again, the particular uh, community uh, that they are depicting. Uh, and I will give a few examples of that as well. Oftentimes there are extensive lists of those who hail from a particular town or village in the book. This is from uh, a book that I, uh, from a book on, 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 on Cis. And again, uh, you see here lists just of people, of names of families and individuals who hail from that location. And then at the end of the book, there's also at the end of the list, this, these blank sheets where people can fill in the names of their children and grandchildren, essentially continuing that kind of connection. Uh, maps are absolutely crucial, as I mentioned in many of these, and an important way to connect for people uh, and have a sense of where their ancestors lived. In many of these towns and villages, 
uh, the entire, uh, particularly cities and larger cities, much of what used to be the Armenian quarter is not there, right? Adana is one good example, right? The entire old Adana uh, largely does not exist today. Uh, and therefore, uh, to have any kind of sense of what is there, these maps are, uh, are, are very helpful to see what, how the city has changed, how the town has changed. But even more importantly, these maps are helpful in places where the town or village has not changed much. So one of the, uh, uh, the experiences I have uh, visited and uh, for research, I've made research trips on 25 research trips to Turkey, particularly the Eastern uh, region of Turkey over the past uh, decade or so. And, and these maps have proven extremely uh, helpful because they uh, depict household by household where uh, people lived. And oftentimes as I travel with other researchers and scholars who are doing uh, uh, work, artists, filmmakers, authors, one of the things that comes often is uh, emphasizes using these maps for them to find, you know, the homes of their uh, ancestors. Uh, this is a map of the a village of uh, Havav, Havav often referred to in, in the Palu area. The village was almost entirely Armenian before 1915, and uh, most of the houses are still there. And the village is now, uh, so when one village uh, visits the village, and this is a, a Google Maps, uh, Google Earth uh, depiction essentially of uh, different sites of importance, including a couple of families of uh, a friend of mine who accompanied me on one of these uh, these research trips as she was interested in finding her ancestors' homes. And that's exactly what we did. The Boranian household and the Sultanian household are where the pins you see in the, in the north, uh, in the northeast, are the ones that uh, I'm, I'm referring to here. And we did end up finding both of those households. Uh, one of them in ruins, but the other actually was home to a wonderful uh, family that hosted us. Uh, my friend, who uh, is a descendant of uh, Armenians who survived uh, the Armenian genocide in, in Palu Havav, she is on the left side of the, uh, of, of the screen. And, uh, and this is the family that lives actually on uh, in that house right now. And this is an image of her uh, during that encounter. Now, uh, in many ways, uh, even though for, uh, for Armenians in particular, memorial books are treated as even artifacts, right? Armenians who don't even speak Armenian will keep copies of these books in their homes uh, because it is sort of a piece of their town and village. Uh, and, and this is something, a theme that is often highlighted. But ultimately, memorial books uh, have uh, tremendous are tremendous resources for ethnographers, for musicians and artists, because you will see oftentimes in these books uh, hundreds of songs included. Sometimes with the notes, uh, you'll see. As I mentioned, the uh, I mentioned the importance for demo demographers, genealogists, historians, and others. But ultimately, I think uh, in in an era of increased displacement, in an era where uh, violence, war, particularly in the Middle East, continues to create these uh, waves and waves of displacement and, and loss and dispossession. Uh, the way in which we think about and serve and uh, uh, memorial books and the way in which we think about transitioning them into the digital world is one that is, uh, that's going to have impact beyond uh, the confines that I was talking about and the interest that I was highlighting over the past several minutes. Because ultimately, uh, in, in this day and age in the digital world, we will, it's even more easier for us to carry our hometown or village and take it with us as we move elsewhere. And in that kind of reality, in that kind of, uh, in, in the realities where, uh, you know, entire regions and towns are, you know, uh, destroyed, whether through natural, disasters or through uh, war and violence. The city of Raqqa is a good example now, right? Uh, there is something from these cities that is kept and passed on. And there's much that we can learn from memorial books in terms of how we can, uh, as, as librarians, uh, how we can make those accessible and available for uh, th those stories and revive these, these environments for future 
generations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Moradian. So our next speaker is uh, Harun Tuncher. Um, he, uh, I, I apologize for my uh, Turkish accent. I actually don't speak Turkish. <laughs> He studied English language and literature at the University of Istanbul and earned uh, his MA working on James William Redhouse. His PhD focused on the history of British missionary activities um, and he uh, graduated in 2019, is that um, correct? Um, Dr. Tenso, your, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lady Enis. Uh, uh, this is Harun, as Lady said, uh, from Istanbul. Uh, and I'm working for some time uh, for Hyperlink and now uh, I'm going to present uh, to you a, you know, slider. Uh, can I share my screen? Please, could you please uh, let me share my screen? You should be able to. Uh, it says what's disabled. Yeah. Oh, if not, Justin, would you please authorize um, Screen sharing. Um, Harun is a co-host, so I don't understand. If you click the, um, what does it say when you click the share screen button at the bottom? It is still not allowed. I'm trying to host the table, Boston screen sharing. Needs to be a co-host. Oh, did I give it to the? Oh, so I'm sorry. There are two rooms. That's my fault. Oh right. Okay. Yeah, that would explain it. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. You're welcome. Okay, you should be good to go. Oh, okay. Now it is done. Thank you so much. Excellent. Um, <laughs> good. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you. Thank you. Beginning. Uh, the title of the presentation is Creating the Google for Ottoman Turkish, Viki Lala. And uh, let me sum up uh, when I'm starting. Uh, the headings will be a short introduction about Viki Lala. Then I will go further with the stimulation for the project and comes as a third, the process and the ways of success. And the last, uh, what are to come? what we are going to plan and what our uh, next projects uh, I will talk about uh, later. Then, yes, Wikilala is an online digital library project which aims to gather and digitize all the printed texts inherited from the Ottoman Empire since the introduction of the printing press. That will be giving the chance for shedding green light on the empire's history culture and the intellectual legacy as a whole, thousands of books, magazines, journals, newspaper and various other documents in Ottoman Turkish have been digitized and gathered together for this project. Bikilava. And since the reformation of uh, the alphabet in Turkey, as you know, Paul, uh, in 1928, which converted to official script of the Republic in Turkey from Arabic into Latin, there was a serious and significant separation and disengagement from the Ottoman past. And it is a must to say that the society and the academy became unfortunately oblivious to the Ottoman culture, social structure and political knowledge for a couple of decades due to the political and social atmosphere then prevailed. However, there was a significant uh, or crucial treasure trove of knowledge waiting to be discovered in Ottoman texts. Uh, I have, you know, uh, counted uh, just a few minutes ago, produced since the time of Ibrahim Mujahedika, who introduced the printing press to the empire and was the first Muslim convert to run a printing press with movable, movable Arabic types. And what is the stimulation? Why we did this? The Turkish society as a whole and partly the academic milieu are oblivious to the to this uh, wealth of knowledge. They don't know how to access it, how to make use of it. Once they do access, if they can, they don't have many means to 
search through all those texts. This fact has been the thing that stimulates us to develop the project. This is a rejuvenation movement, like a late time renaissance in Ottoman studies, I do believe. The project provides means for a rebirth for the huge stock of knowledge. That is our main aim. And the process and the ways of access. As part of the project, the documents, uh, how we are doing this you know, job. Uh, the documents are transferred into the digital library in a three-part process. In the first stage, to tap, the documents are scanned in high resolution if they are obtained as a physical copy, of course, and then they are digitized. Then the digitized copies, documents are cataloged and last of all, are uploaded to the system, to the database, where they are available to be read and analyzed. And one, once they are registered, the researchers can access the documents online without having to obtain physical copies from libraries. They can also search through the documents easily and quickly using the system search engine, which can be used with Arabic and Latin letters, thanks to the optical character recognition or OCR technique used in the sequence. The database, which has just launched with its newest interface, houses almost 150,000 more than all documents in Ottoman Turkish, including newspapers, as I said, journals, books, and other manuscripts. A worldwide interest, uh, thankfully, we have with a talented group of software developers and humanities experts. We have been working on the project for two years and recently launched the full version of the website. In eight months' time, there have been more than 423,000 personal accesses from over 145 different countries. And subscribers and references, uh, many universities, more than 90, are you know, using the trial version uh, until the end of the year. For example, Boazici University, Cornell, Ankara University of Istanbul, the biggest and the first university of Ottoman Turkey. Libraries, more than 80, uh, for example, the nation's library and others, uh, other public libraries uh, also in Turkey are using this database and governmental institutions as well, now using the trial version. And what are to come? Uh, here is a, you know, small summary uh, of what we did and what we are doing now and what are we to do. We succeeded to, the, to make research and digitize Ottoman texts in February. And then now we are enriching the content with a decent interface and a comprehensive infrastructure. And the goal is uh, new catalogs are coming and manuscripts, images from the you know, materials that we have and archival documents will be uploaded to the system and we will make it possible to get the translated text if uh, the you know, researcher wants. He will be able to do this. Truly, we are just at the beginning and more are to come. We will have uploaded half of the number of documents that we want to reach till the first half of the coming year and researchers with the contributions of our users and uh, we'll have access to a body of works amounting to 2 million pages of the 5, 6 million pages that we believe exist. The second move will be the transcription of the documents. Thanks to the AI technologies, users will have the chance to ask for the transliteration of the pieces of text they look for, they find through the search engine. Then as last step, users by the end of 2022, we'll be able to get the simplified version of the transliterated Ottoman Turkish texts if they need, for example, uh, while they are using in the research uh, for the audience, uh, it must be simplified. For example, we have used several sources to supply the catalog of the library, including foreign open source libraries and public and private Ottoman collections. It is also possible for the users to upload themselves the royalty free. This is important and uh, in quotes, documents and images they hold through clicking the upload option seen on the home page. So 
Wikilala is an interactive and user-friendly database that will do much service for almost every researcher from any field of science, we do believe. And good tidings, we have an award that uh, was conferred on the uh, as the Innovative Initiative of the Year Award in April of this year by the Ministry of Culture and Tourism in Turkey. And Excessive Statistics here is seen the standing, uh, the five, you know, uh, first coming um, states or uh, seven states, Turkey, Germany, United States, United Kingdom, Netherlands, France, Belgium, uh, many, many, you know, students from all around the globe are using this database, actually, it seems. And how it works, we have a short video uh, that will, you know, uh, give you a chance to have a look up how it works, how the system works. And I will now click it and you will see if it works. It has, you know, language options in English. You have Spanish flu, for example, you are looking for. It is, you know, in background translating it into Ottoman Turkish. And in a very short time, it is opened. And it is blurred, you will see. Espanol Nezlesi as in Turkish, of course, it is called Espanol Nezlesi. As you see, it is in Jumhuriyet newspaper. Then another, okay, you have keyboard options. For example, you want to write in Ottoman Turkish, you can, if you like. Then Washington is looked for. In Shehbal, it is found. And now it is opening. You can zoom in and more easily view the page. Many, you know, Washington is seen. Londres, London, the capital city of the UK. It is found in Salvative Room, for example. And as a large research, Darwin is looked for. Mr. Darwin, the late biologist, scientist. Yes, his mention and his own picture is seen. Upload yourself, you see. And this is it, uh, as you have seen. And uh, we are, you know, producing uh, many other projects, uh, uh, especially, you know, to be helpful for those researchers that are interested in uh, mostly this project, for example, uh, Kelime Kong uh, and E. Osmanlıca, E. Ottoman Turkish, or I can say, uh, for you to understand. Uh, and other uh, project is HyperKitab. Uh, it is the first Turkish online library, a comprehensive ebook database that covers all fields in Turkish literature. We are, you know, uh, putting very much stress in uh, on, I'm, I'm sorry, on Turkish content to be able to uh, get access uh, from all over the world. It is very much important for us. And uh, not just in Latin Turkish, but in Ottoman Turkish, uh, the content we are interested in and trying to be accessible, trying to be make it accessible. And Kelime Kom, 
uh, I will show you a you know um, sample page uh, for this one in a com. It's a database of dictionaries that provide you with the class meaning and origin of a word, for example, word finds the similar or de derivatives of the word in question and deciphers. This is very much important. Deciphers the words that cannot be read uh, because it is omitted, for example, or cannot be read. This is uh, e Osman Hoca is an application offering Ottoman Turkish courses on a gamified learning platform. It is an uh, digital platform as well. And thank you to all for having us here and uh, showing the patience to listen to me. And I will show you as a last example, uh, a page from my uh, kitab. This is, you know, uh, this have options in both Turkish and English language. Uh, you can write your book that you are looking for here. Then, for example, you see, you see the book here. Uh, then on the other page, you can read it as a EPUB or PDF. It is not open, so I'm sorry for that. And kelimenokta.com, as I said, this is very much important. Uh, it has a keyboard option as well, as I said before. Uh, for example, you can write in Ottoman Turkish using this keyboard, uh, online keyboard. Uh, and for example, uh, there, there in the text, there is a word that cannot be read uh, for just one, for example, syllable or letter. You just uh, place this, you know, dot uh, and you will see the options that are to be created with this uh, word, this uh, omitted word, for example, uh, the first one, uh, the first letter is uh, seen, the second is long, and you cannot read the uh, third letter, uh, it is omitted, and the last letter is M. For this omission, you, you know, put this, then you will see the options comes down here, and for example, if you Salalim click on this, you will see its meaning in many, you know, dictionaries, for example, uh, Osman Muja in general, Ottoman Turkish dictionary, Kamus ul Nuhit, and Redouns Turkish uh, and English lexicon, for example, uh, all are uploaded into the uh, database. It means letter to tell cases, Selalim or Selem. And uh, thank you so much again, uh, I'm finished. And I hope you enjoy it. And if anyone wants, we can get into contact uh, via our you know, emails and telephones. Thank you so much. I'm finished. Thank you very much, um, everyone, for your uh, fascinating and really interesting presentations. Um, so now I'm going to open the floor for questions. Um, and I see one question coming through the chat. Amanda, do you want to uh, say it out loud or do I read it for you? Okay, these are all so exciting. I would love to hear more about EOS Monitor. Uh, have you considered doing something similar for modern Turkish, German Turkish? Uh, everything I've been able to find online has been controversial purposes. Yes, actually, lady, uh, we will give you much more you know, information by uh, email. Uh, and we'll be getting into contact with you soon. Uh, Lady Amanda, thank you so much for your interest. Thank you. Yeah, it was kind of a selfish question, but I've been looking <laughs> to read Turkish, to learn to read Turkish for, you know, librarian purposes, not, yeah. not for conversational purposes, and it's hard to find anything, and this is all so cool. I'm really impressed. Uh, thank you so much. Actually, we are, you know, uh, cooperating with uh, more than uh, 400 uh, Turkish uh, publishers in here uh, and you know in our database we are holding the books and uh, this is a database that are you know sold to the universities uh, and uh, many other institutions both uh, in and out of Turkey so uh, this is very much for you uh, I do believe yes another question maybe no. Are there any other questions or comments? 
If I can unmute, I'm Joan Weeks uh, at the Library of Congress. I'm head of the Near East Collections and uh, my all time <laughs> uh, project for digitization has been the Abdul Hami gift book collection. And just two days ago, I was discussing, or not Monday, I was discussing with a colleague who had uh, digitized the microfilm and the books and looking at how we could do OCR of some kind of project where there would be actually a transcription to the modern Turkish. And I wondered if you had considered, we've got the entire uh, 323 gift books digitized in JPEG 2000, uh, all sorts of uh, content and wonder if uh, somehow that could be, that corpus could be included in uh, this fantastic uh, project of yours and uh, how we might uh, collaborate a bit with that. Great lady. Uh, actually, we will be very much pleased to, to collaborate and uh, I do hope we will uh, and we will do our best, you know, to be helpful to you uh, and to our database as well. Please be in contact with me and with my company, lady. I don't have a question to, I don't have a question to both Marion and I don't pronounce your name, Curses? How do you decide that the term that is being used is offensive? Who actually determined that? Is it based on culture or it is based on definitions? Do you want to take it, Kirsty, or shall I? That's, that's a great question, of course. Um, so what we did is um, we started with, so our kind of first working list was um, the terms that were listed in the Words Matter um, guide. And um, each term in the glossary, in the Words Matter glossary is accompanied by an explanation of why this term might be problematic and some suggestions for how it should be treated in cataloging um, or you know, by people working in kind of cultural in the museum and, and library sector. So um, we started with these, but we also added our own. And the ones, the terms that we added were based on our experience um, in how we have seen these terms being used in the records. And um, I should probably point out that we keep adding to them. So um, we have this list of, of terms that we've already discussed, but we keep adding um, new terms come up all the time because we realize that right, this term is being used in the records in, in, an, in a potentially problematic way. And, and we've had discussions about them. We've also identified terms, um, like um, Chris said, we've also identified terms that um, are problematic only to Arabic users. Um, so these were flagged by us as translators rather than because of how they are used in the records. Um, we, so we had an internal discussion about these, and then we had uh, we also consulted with the India Office Records team in the British Library, um, who confirmed some you know of our classifications and made some suggestions as well. Um, so basically, our classifications are based on the work on previous work of others, as well as our internal discussions and consultations with other groups within the library. Thank you. Marlis, do you want to ask your question? Yes, I just, perhaps I missed this, but um, going back to Haroon's presentation of Wikilala is, uh, and perhaps the answer is on the website, but is this an open access 
uh, a resource or or you is, is it something where you establish um, a subscription to it or how, how how does that work just briefly okay lady thank you so much for your question uh, this is actually uh, free for use uh, till the end of the year if you are registered then it will be a you know uh, subscribing database for the universities and other institutions globally so uh, it must be answering your question right <laughs> right so so there will be information on the website yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, what, sure. what you need to do to subscribe yes step thank by you. step thank Go you up, I don't see anything coming through the chat. Are there any more questions for our speakers? Hi, um, yes, I actually, uh, it's not, um, it's more of a comment for Kachik. Um, really enjoyed both both of our um, fellow panelists presentations. Um, but um, I think these memorial books sound wonderful. And what um, I was thinking about was uh, when I did my um, dissertation on archives in post-conflict societies, um, I read uh, an article that mentioned um, a website that had been created by a community that had been displaced by the Yugoslav wars in the early 1990s. And they had built a website which sounds very much like a digital version of these memorial books where they had people plot out, create maps, plot out who used to live where, um, talk about their way of life, what they used to eat, what sort of job they did, the farming, all, all of the same kind of details. Um, and what was really sad is that this website um, was held up as a great resource and the link was in the article. Um, and when I clicked on the link, the site had actually been bought by an Australian landscaper. And so everything had gone, uh, which was really heartbreaking after hearing about this. So I just wanted to comment, you know, the, the idea is that paper is easier to preserve um, than digital material. So I'm really pleased to hear that, they, that these are in paper form to prevent something like that happening, because um, I don't know what sort of funding might be there to help the people creating these books uh, preserve them, but at least the funding won't be as, um, uh, if it were a digital project, for example, they probably would need a lot more. So just to comment that really. Yeah, and if, perhaps if I can say a couple of words about that, th that's that's an excellent example. There's several others uh, such initiatives uh, online, and oftentimes, of course, with the websites, they also become a uh, challenge in other ways, right? You have you've had cases where uh, you know uh, governments will take it down and things like that, but ultimately uh, one of the greater challenges in the virtual world is that even though uh, there's a lot more that's out there, uh, one of the things that's lacking is enough efforts to really bring these accounts and testimonies together in one place kind of the, uh, approach, right? So the kind of job that the editors were doing compiling these like, you know, hundreds of pages of, of, of books, these, these huge books, doorstoppers uh, really about this, you know, in the here and now it's much easier. You don't have to write an email and wait for four years to get a response. But on the other hand, it's, it's again, uh, the, the complication is to really create repositories and databases that can house such collections and actually make them accessible. I, you know, in, in a, even in the, in the Jewish example I mentioned as well, score books, there are some websites similar for descendants of survivors who, uh, again, highlight uh, life and culture and heritage in a particular location. It is a phenomenon that increasingly, particularly in Syria and other places, becoming more urgent as, you know, you know, as time passes, it's, 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 it's a lot more of a challenge 
to uh, re reconstitute many of these, you know, it's a way of life and culture and tradition and, and all that. There would be time for one last question or comment. Can I say something? Yes, of course. Okay, as it is ending, uh, I hope we will be meet next time, uh, not virtually, physically, I hope. And uh, I do thank to my co-panelists, Kashing and Maryam and Eddie Craig. Uh, it is fantastic to be here. Thank you so much to the committee and others for listening. Uh, that's all from, from me. Thank you. Well, so I guess that's a nice transition to ending the, the panel. So <laughs> let me thank you all again uh, for proposing the papers and for uh, being here today. Thank you for everyone who attended uh, this panel. Um, and the recording will be posted uh, sometime in the coming weeks on the YouTube channel. Uh, so don't forget to disconnect from this session and connect to the next one. Next on the program is the cataloging program, which sounds yeah. fascinating. Yeah. I don't need that. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you soon. Thank you.